Welcome to Expert Talks by Calcane TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Ms. Jem Romold, the director of Quit Nukes. She's also the recipient of the 2021 Peace Women Award from Women's International League for Peace and Freedom or WILPF. And for some background, Quit Nukes is a campaign for Australian financial institutions to exclude nuclear weapons producing companies from investments. And Jim's a former radio producer with a love for campaign strategy, collecting, organising and building community power as per her LinkedIn bio. So this is bound to be an interesting interview. Bringing you live today, we have Ms. Gemma Romold, Director of Quit Nukes. Welcome to the show, Gem. Thanks so much for having me, Sage. And I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, it's Romold. R-A-M-U-L-D. Thank you very much. Jem, congratulations on the great work that you do for this fantastic cause and your recent award from WILPF. Thanks so much. It's great to have you with us. We better make the most of this valuable time with you. And ethical investing, it's a great place to start, is gaining more attention these days. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the Quit Nukes initiative works for the cause? Yeah, of course. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about this project. So it is a project to specifically look at the companies that produce or are involved in the production of nuclear weapons and to what extent Australian pension funds, also known as superannuation funds, are invested in them. So it's a joint project of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and MAPW, which is the Medical Association for Prevention of War. And it really was inspired by a global campaign called Don't Bank on the Bomb. So while most people that you ask day to day absolutely despise nuclear weapons and want nothing to do with them, um, unfortunately most of our banks and superannuation funds actually do have holdings in, in the companies that, um, that produce them. So we're actually working to bring the industry more into line with public expectation. And you know we want it to be harder for companies that are involved in producing nuclear weapons to continue that part of their business because you know we see that nothing good whatsoever comes from these weapons and the international community has uh, made a very clear stand on these weapons and has decided to clearly reject them um, by negotiating and bringing about the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Thank you so much for summing that up for us and recently we've seen what the impact of war can be on the economy with the spikes in commodities and other things that are gaining because of the spoils of war, unfortunately. Mm. Could you clarify for us, are the controversial nuclear weapons now illegal and how much weight does the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons have on this matter, please? Yeah, certainly. So uh, nuclear weapons are illegal now under international law because that treaty I mentioned, the uh, Treaty on, for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, entered into force in January 2021. And so that means that nuclear weapons are now uh, in the same category as other controversial weapons. So I think of landmines, cluster munitions, biological and chemical weapons that are all subject to international prohibition treaties now. So there are currently uh, 86 signatories and 59 states parties. So 59 countries have ratified and those numbers are steadily climbing. Um, but the treaty is only strictly binding on the countries that have ratified it. Um, so however, all the same international law does set a new standard for everyone and it works incrementally over time to build an expectation and to build pressure. So. You know, we see it as uh, setting a new norm and a new um, social expectation, if you like, that nuclear weapons are unacceptable and so is any activity or policy that supports them in any way, including financing them. And we can see the evidence of this norm starting to take hold in, in financial institutions worldwide that have decided to cut ties with these companies and um, even in countries that haven't ratified the treaty. So I'm thinking of uh, Norway, the Netherlands and Japan, uh, some of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world and, and banks have decided that because of this new norm, um, they, they want to cut their investments in these companies. Here in Australia, however, our government hasn't yet joined this treaty, um, but the federal opposition party has committed to do so. 
So we expect that when that happens, uh, there'll be many more financial institutions that make that decision to exclude uh, the producers of nuclear weapons. Thank you so much for summing that up for us. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know that nuclear weapons are illegal uh, according to the binds of the treaty. Um, I'm sure a lot of people would like to see President Putin for his actions recently be uh, thought of as a criminal for war crimes. And Absolutely. unfortunately, a lot of money goes into the manufacturing of weaponry and this involves many chemical companies which also aid other industries. Um, what are other stats please? How many super funds are investing in nuclear weapons? Yeah, certainly, Sage. So recently we published a report looking exactly at that question for Australian superannuation funds. And it took quite a bit of research because the funds have not been very transparent about their holdings. So this was a joint project with a research group called the Australia Institute. And we looked at about around 24 of the biggest Australian superannuation funds, representing uh, around 80% of superannuation funds under management across the country and about 80% of superannuation fund members. And we found that the majority of them clearly do actually have investments in nuclear weapons companies. So there is a considerable inconsistency between uh, what many of the super funds actually uh, state publicly and then what they actually do do. So very few funds fully and openly uh, disclose their investments in these companies. In some cases, they give the strong impression on their website or other uh, materials, documents that they have no tolerance for nuclear weapons companies when in reality, uh, they do actually invest if that company is in a certain country or if it makes less than, say, 5% of their revenue from their nuclear activities. Uh, our approach uh, as a campaign group, of course, is to, have, um, to advocate for zero tolerance of these producers and that it's not enough for just an ethical option in a fund to exclude them, but they should be excluded from all portfolios. Now, Sage, there are only around 25 companies worldwide that are involved in the manufacture of these of nuclear weapons delivery systems or components. And for the funds that do have holdings in these, it's actually a very small percentage of their funds. So excluding them would not have any real negative or material impact on their fiduciary duty to members. So um, we also found in this report that nine funds highlight their exclusion of controversial weapons, uh, but they don't actually include nuclear weapons in their definition of controversial weapons. So um, it's definitely time now. Uh, I think most people would, would agree that nuclear weapons are clearly controversial weapons. They are inhumane, they're indiscriminate, and now illegal under international law. So we're looking for those funds to, to treat them uh, as they do treat these other weapons that I mentioned before, biological, chemical weapons, landmines, and cluster bombs, and to put them, up, put them in that controversial category for exclusion across the board. Thank you, Jem. Um, so you mentioned that it's not always uh, straightforward. There's a little bit of uh, cloudiness, greyness there. Companies are not always transparent with the data. Um, who does your group lobby? Um, uh, well, you're lobbying against them, but who's the regulating body? Is it ACCC? Yeah, it's APRA is the main super fund regu regulatory body. And we have met with APRA um, we've met with a number of regulatory bodies and we've also met with uh, the super funds themselves. And a lot of the time they are um, just fairly slow, change is fairly slow in the funds. So we're, we are seeing some change with a few of them and we do have um, a couple of major wins that has been fantastic. So two of the big superannuation funds, Host Plus and Care Super, have decided to exclude nuclear weapons uh, from their holdings and Host Plus has also implemented a really strong policy. Um, they've decided to put uh, nuclear weapons in their definition of controversial weapons for exclusion across the board. So that's really positive and hopefully many more will follow. Um, but yes, we've been talking directly with the funds, talking with their members, talking with other industry bodies and regulators as well. And uh, one of the important things is that a lot of them may not be up to date yet. So because the nuclear weapon ban treaty only entered into force last year, uh, I think we're, we're, we'll see more change in the years to come as the industry catches up to that new standard. 
Thank you for explaining that for us. And it seems that the amount of money that governments spend into weapons is controversial at, at the least. I mean, to mention um, the recent spending for the nuclear submarines that um, Scott Morrison has done, it seems like there's been a little bit of um, misunderstanding there and perhaps money could be used in other ways than just for national security. But it's times like this that we're in at the moment that maybe makes us think that national security is the number one priority for governments. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think, you know, national security is, is important, but I think we need to look at uh, what does national security mean? I mean, the submarine deal is uh, it's certainly not at all a done deal at this stage and I think that's there's a lot of uh, provocation and aggression in that uh, notion as well. It would be unprecedented for Australia um, to gain nuclear powered submarines. Uh, currently all of the countries that have nuclear powered submarines also have nuclear weapons so um, it requires a special treatment for Australia under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and some experts say that uh, that this really does threaten the NPT uh, and, and that's a really important treaty that does, you know, govern nuclear materials worldwide and it does also oblige all state parties to pursue nuclear disarmament and to um, have strong standards on uh, non-proliferation and not spreading mater nuclear materials beyond um, where they already are and ideally getting rid of them as well. So for Australia to actually bring in highly enriched uranium, uh, which is weapons grade uh, material, uh, would be very controversial. So I, I feel that that's not actually in our security interests. And if we look around at the um, at what is making uh, Australian people feel unsafe at the moment, the climate crisis is um, clearly creating havoc. There's been the flood disasters, uh, you know, the fires, there are other needs that um, that the community has. Absolutely, and the storage of this type of mineral as well has to be looked at, whether it's safe enough for the surrounding areas. You're absolutely right, the, the fragility of the ecosystem is, is at risk with this type of mineral. Um, from your understanding of the situation, please, what is the public polling sentiment in Australia on attitudes towards this type of investment in nuclear weapons? Yeah, certainly. So we we have done some recent pol public polling, uh, and that was done by the with the Australia Institute as well. And it found that seven out of ten people expect nuclear weapons to be included in that definition of controversial weapons. Uh, we also found seven in ten people are not sure whether their fund does or does not have holdings in nuclear weapons producers, and that same percentage of people again clearly do not want their superannuation funds to be invested in these in these uh, nuclear weapons producers. And then an even higher proportion, so four out of five people want transparency from their funds on their nuclear weapons holdings. So um, there is some good news here on the horizon. Uh, super funds in Australia will actually be required to disclose a lot more of their holdings, most of their holdings, as of the end of March and every six months thereafter. So it will make it much easier for members to choose funds that align with their values. That's excellent, great to hear. So great to hear that your work and dedication is actually helping to make changes in the area. Um, we're coming to the end of the discussion now, Jem. Thank you so much for your valuable insights, learning a lot here. We're witnessing a historic use of economic sanctions as almost a weapon of mass destruction in itself against Russia in the current Ukraine crisis. And it's closing many doors to Russia. Do you think the economy can stay liquid and investors can still make money if the investing in companies that support nuclear weapons are not invested in? Yeah, that's a really important question, Sage, uh, because the super funds do have a, a, a duty to their members. Um, but we've actually compared the performance of indices from MSCI and FTSE that show actually slightly better performance of ind indices that exclude nuclear weapons producers. So where, and when we we're looking at the super funds in Australia, when we could find the dollar figures, it turned out that these investments were usually less than half a percentage of their total holding. So it would actually have no material impact on the funds to uh, draw a line and to cut ties with these nuclear weapons producers. We also know that ethical investing is only increasing in, in popularity and it's performing very well. 
So with the increased transparency, you know, I think this moment in time is a wake up call to funds to get out of harmful products like nuclear weapons producers. And as we're watching this Russian invasion with horror and with nuclear weapons clearly on the table, we have to be reminded that these weapons don't do anyone any good and that we should have got rid of them really after the Cold War. Instead of feeling hopeless though, I think we all have a responsibility and an opportunity to make sure that at least we aren't supporting the industry that makes these uh, these abhorrent weapons through our banks or our super funds and that's certainly what we're working on. Thank you, Jem. And if p viewers want to join the cause, if they want to get involved, how can they reach out to you? Yeah, we have a website, which is uh, quitnukes.org. And if you'd like to look at the findings in that report in more detail, and we do actually name all of the funds that we looked at and, and detail uh, the policies, their holdings, everything that we could find about them, um, then you would just go to quitnukes.org forward slash report. Thanks again. And we do appreciate your insights and the time and thought you've given this interview. It's made a very informative discussion. Good, thanks very much for having me, Sage. Best of luck. Please go to Kalkine Media's YouTube channel and keep watching for more live expert talks and market insights. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine Media.